Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Sovereign living God, we praise you for who you are, Lord. And we recognize the times in which we live. These are the most fearsome, wonderful, terrifying, exhilarating, overwhelming times and yet we recognize Lord in the midst of the fearsome things we've been discussing and the frightening situations and circumstances around us that you are in control none of this happens but by your hand your prophets warned us long ago Lord you yourself told us what the signs of the age would be and what to look out for. And we recognize, Lord, that the battle we are now in is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Yet, living God, we recognize that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God, appeared for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And we rejoice in that, Lord, and we stand firm in that. We look to you, Father, to draw back the veil of deception and to give us ears willing to listen to what your Spirit tells us in these last days. For judgment has already begun upon this land, indeed, Lord, upon the world. Yet it is filtered through the loving and tender and merciful hand of our Abba. So we commit this time to you, Father, and we ask that you would guide it and direct it in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. 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 I hope some of you brought your Bibles, because we're going to be referring to it. If you didn't, pull out your handy, trusty piece of paper and your pen, because even if you don't, sadly, have your scriptures with you, I want you to make note of some of the things as we go through. I'd like you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. And in Matthew 24, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, I think, puts into context the things that we've been seeing in our society in these last years, the fearsome and sobering reports that we've been listening to today and that are still to come. The Dr. Stan and our other wonderful guests with so much information and knowledge have been presenting. But we need to know that the Lord himself told us what to look for. The disciples came to the Lord. They were troubled about some of the things that Jesus Christ was saying for, to them. And they said to them, Lord, what are the signs of the end of the age and of your coming? You're telling us these fearful things are going to happen. How are we going to know when the end is near and what are the signs of the end of the age? And Jesus said to him, the first thing Jesus said, and we're all aware of the other signs, aren't we? The wars, the rumors of wars the famines that are coming upon us, the plagues that we hear how they're even now being orchestrated on many levels, interestingly enough, the terrible circumstances and situations. But what is the one sign Jesus starts out with? He says, beginning in verse 4, See to it that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Then he says in verse 11, For many false prophets will arise and will deceive many. And then in case you didn't get it the first two times, he tells you a third time. In verse 24 and 25 he says, For false Christs and false prophets will arise, and here's the kicker, will show you great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, were it possible, even the elect. Now, the elect of today have kind of a, a false sense of security when it comes to this, because assuming they ever get around to reading a passage like this, they say, if it were possible to deceive the elect, and of course, we know it isn't. I'm sincere. I'm devoted. I'm a committed believer. I could never be deceived. If I ask God for a loaf, he's not going to give me a snake or a scorpion. 
If I ask him for a fish, he's not going to give me a rock or some other nasty crawly. I can trust my big God to be bigger than your big bad old devil. I don't need to worry about deception if I'm sincere. People, the Lord is telling us, and so do the prophets, and so do the apostles, that sincerity in about, what is it, seven bucks these days, Dr. Stan? I'll get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Sincerity acts not as a magical blanket of protection for anybody. And we need to know that in these end times, we are seeing now the coming together of everything that the prophets have spoken about. The orchestrating of a one world government, the orchestrating of a one world monetary system, a one world food authority, a one world at all ad nauseum. But what is going to be the glue that holds it all together? A one world religion. Bound not by dogma, ooh, that's a dirty word today. Johanna, you're not into doctrine and dogma, are you? You bet I am. And anybody who takes the word of God seriously had better be, because if we do not know the doctrines, the solid foundational teachings given by the prophets, fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are going to be among those who are going to find ourselves deceived in the last days. If it were possible to deceive even the elect, I hate to tell you, I'm no Greek scholar, but I am told by those who are, and I've checked with several, that if it were possible is, let's see if I get this right, a first class conditional clause in the Greek, which means if it is possible, and it is, even if for a short period of time, to deceive the elect. Now what is it that we're seeing coming together? We are seeing now with all of these tragedies and circumstances, with all of the massive influx of false religions and false Christs and false prophets, we are now seeing the setup for the coming of the one world ruler. That man of perdition spoken about in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, the son of lawlessness, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple displaying himself as being God. Now, 25, 30 years ago, somebody coming up and displaying himself as being God would have been unthinkable. We'd have locked him up in the local loony bin right next to the guy who thinks he's Napoleon or a poached egg. But now we're hearing a whole different thing on the spiritual arena, aren't we? I am God. We are going to do these meditation techniques through contemplative prayer, through yoga. I know some of you are involved in that, and I just hit a couple of hot buttons, I venture to wager here. Through yoga, through the meditation techniques, through the occult technologies, to give us all an experience of what? Personal divinity to open up our awareness that we are divine. So when we talk now about one who is coming, proclaiming himself to be God, the one world ruler, the Antichrist, that's not going to catch most of us, even in the church, too much by surprise. After all, we are all little gods. Kenneth Copeland tells us that, right? When Jesus says, I am, yes, I am too. He tells us in some of his works, Believer's Voice of Victory, 1987, God has little gods just like dogs have puppies and cats have kittens. We are little gods. John chapter 10 asserts that. Taken out of context, you better learn if you're going to take scripture seriously to read it in context. And so now when the Antichrist comes up and says, we are God, that's going to resonate with those in the New Age who are trying to reach and awaken the divine within the Christ spirit. It's going to resonate with our evangelicals, and there's an oxymoron tied in with the people who are proposing these things, who are telling you they too are gods when Jesus says, I am, yes, I am too. And the only difference is going to be the Antichrist is just going to be gaudier than the rest of them, so it's not going to catch him off guard at all. Look, the concept of a beautiful side of evil frightens many people and takes us all off guard. We expect evil to oblige us by showing itself for what it is up front. The good guys wear the white hats, the bad guys wear the black hats. They give us an obliging sneer so that we know what we're looking for. But even though we have that assumption on many levels, we have it 
on a spiritual level where it says if good fruit is taking place if somebody is being healed if a prophecy is taking place if a wonder or a dream or something that gives me the warm fuzzies comes through if the prophet or this man of God and he must be because he preaches in a in a transparent church and they fly their jets and they've got mega trillion books all over the national globe in 58 different languages or thereabouts surely this must be showing the blessing of God and we assume that that is something good and holy and so one of the tragedies that those of us who have been following the world of the occult and the new age and how it's coming to fulfill now the prophecies of scripture have seen is that here even in the church we have embraced occult technologies thrown Christian terminology at it Christian yoga Christian mantras Christian meditation Christian guided imagery visualization the same techniques that I along with countless millions of others are embracing in the world of the occult we have now taken that to our bosom and assumed that it's from God but I will assure you and we're going to look at the Word of God to back up my assertions much as I may be particularly fond of my own personal opinion when it comes right down to it basically who cares if you're not testing what each of us here says, what I say to you, what any self-proclaimed prophet or apostle or teacher, whether it is Benny Hinn or Kenneth Copeland or Todd Bentley, God bless him, or, or your local pastor, or me, you had better, if you take the word of God seriously, be testing it against the word of God. Because I will tell you that however sanctified the terminology God is not going to bless the use of occult techniques just because you're sincere. While the occult may seem beautiful, positive, useful for helping even Christians experience, you're going to hear that word a lot, experience the divine. It is as deadly, blatantly occultic and dangerous as open Satanism. Now, some of you, I'm watching your faces are cringing as I say that. On what basis does this woman dare stand up and say to me that there is no such thing as Christian yoga or Christian Muslims or Christian Buddhists or Desert Fathers guided imagery visualization, Christianized mantras? On what basis does this woman have the unmitigated gall to make such a narrow-minded, dogmatic, bigoted, Bible-thumping, and probably politically incorrect statement? I make that assertion on the basis of the Word of God. And I say that in the face of the opposition of millions. I'm not going to take the time to read you the statistics, but they are legion. Millions of people are involved in experience. Just watch your TV channels, Medium, Ghost Whisperer, Sylvia Brown, Jonathan Edwards. There are millions of in, in, individuals, sincere good people, who think they're communing with, with great aunt whomever to help her move into the light. Move into the light. Unless, of course, something's wrong, in which case it's don't move into the light. Don't move into the light. Take your pick. Millions of people are involved. And I've got to tell you, as I look at these things, I know Carol Matriciana, and, and I'm delighted. I don't know if you all realize that you have here one of the true experts worldwide. Oh, I know I embarrassed her, but it's true, Carol. One of the true, genuine experts on Hinduism, on occultism, on Christian yoga, and the fact that that is one of the most colossally blatant oxymorons, on occultism in general, and those of you who want to know what's going on in the world had better find out what her material says, because she is one of the top researchers in this field. And I know she and I are kind of wistful when it seemed as though the biggest thing we had to handle on the occult realm was dealing with the crystal-powered pants. You guys ever come across that? The crystal-powered pants were pants that the New Agers were marketing and they sew a teeny little crystal at the base of the spine to help awaken the Kundalini force, which rises up through the chakras, which opens up your ultimate chakra, which gives you the experience of being God. 
I think, personally, I always assumed crystal-powered pants were designed for New Agers with deep-seated problems, but that's another matter. <laughs> Witchcraft is the fastest-growing religion on school campuses today, people. If you don't know what the occult is, if you think it's irrelevant and something that only wackos and weirdos look at, think again. The daughter of our worship leader in a church that I'm well acquainted with got involved in Satanism and witchcraft and her worship leader father and mother thought that was okay. The pastor with whom we consulted on this said, oh, that's all right, it's just a fad, she'll outgrow it. As though these forces about which we are speaking are nothing more than bizarre psychological aberrations. People, there is spiritual reality in the realm of the occult. Oprah Winfrey, the church of Oprah Winfrey, we could do an entire week seminar on what Oprah Winfrey is teaching, finding the God within ever since she came across Eric Butterworth's material, Marianne Williamson, Course in Miracles, which by the way, I confirmed personally was being taught on Robert Schuller's Crystal Cathedral. You don't know about the things that are going on because they don't want you to, but you need to pay attention and listen. The secret, the shack, which is one of the most blatant pagan promotions of the God within and goddess spirituality. Papa, who's this big African black woman, anybody would love her. But what are they teaching you? What are they promoting? We could talk for hours about it, but I'm not going to. And look, the Bible affirms the reality of this spiritual realm. Jesus had a personal conversation with a being he called Satan. And he wasn't talking about some dude in a red red spandex union suit with hooves and the, you know that's now very popular around this time in Halloween which by the way for those of you who are getting ready to celebrate Halloween and you think you're taking the Bible seriously you do understand that Halloween the, eve, the feast of Samhain is the high holy day among pagans, neo-pagans, druids, wiccans, witches not to mention Satanists across the world this is not a day of cute little fun with, with Linus uh, sitting in the great pumpkin patch waiting for the arrival of the great pumpkin. Right? Pumpkins are good for pies. But if you think the great pumpkin... Anyway, don't get me on that one. That's another three hours. But look, the Bible affirms and asserts the reality of the occult. Furthermore, I, as long as well as many others, have seen it personally. Some of you are nodding and you know what I'm talking about. From the time I was a little girl, about 11 and a half, something moved into our home. I was born and raised in Mexico in Cuernavaca, which is 45 miles south of Mexico City. American parents, my father fell in love with Mexico and moved uh, his wife down there in 1946. Something moved into our home when I was about 11 and a half, and I'm not going to take the time to tell you the story because I've got more important things to tell you about from scripture than my story. If you're interested, Beautiful Side of Evil documents some of what I went through. But I, suffice it to say, was aware of the existence of another dimension, populated by evil, populated by something fearsome and sinister, that delighted in scaring the daylights out of a little girl through manifestations of visions, grotesque, bizarre, terrifying things. Things that scared the daylights out of any number of housekeepers. We lost a bunch of them over the years. They wouldn't stay in the house because something gives fright here. And they left. When I graduated from college, I went through the college years seeing bizarre things developing occult abilities, I could look at somebody intently and know exactly what they were thinking, which, may I hasten to add, was rarely what they were saying. I began to realize I knew what was going to happen. I began to commune with the beings on the side of my bed, even though I was terrified of them. And I realized also, in addition to it, I had no control over it. It wasn't until I graduated from Wesleyan College, uh, my first two years, and then I left Chapel Hill, North Carolina, with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Theater, in spite of the fact I never could act my way out of a paper sack, but that's another sorry saga, <laughs> was the one thing I could major in without having to take science and math. What can I tell you? <laughs> so I went back to Mexico. Yeah, some of you relate. In fact, most of our school system relates, which is why we are now one of the most functionally illiterate school systems in the entire globe. 
and we're having to import mathematicians and scientists. I should feel guilty about that, but I don't. But when I got back to Mexico, wondering what on earth I was going to do with myself, surrounded by beings and forces I had no control over, one night my father was reading through the paper and he said, Hey, Joe, here's something you might be interested in. And he read to me an ad for Silva Mind Control. Now, mind control, that term has gone out of fashion. They are now the Silva Method. And they're in about, what, 129 countries all over the place, well-known and very popular. Some of you here came up to me already and told me you'd been involved in that. And it's one of many new age groups, uh, kind of a descendant of Eastern mysticism that advocates finding, you're gonna hear this term a lot, their inner God, the genius potential within. Esalen down the road, Carol and I, as we were driving up, just sort of, oh, Esalen, why? This is interesting. Can we come take a tour? No. And they booted us out and made sure somebody escorted us off. They nobody drive in there. I'd like to think they recognized us, but I doubt they knew who either of us was. Anyway, someday perhaps they will. But it was one of many groups advocating finding your inner God, your genius, latent ability. And in about a 48-hour course, using first-level induction techniques from hypnotism, a metronome, teaching you the techniques of Anton Mesmer, techniques that are very popular among some of the big stage prophets and healers and, and wonder workers today, men who have carefully studied the techniques of Anton Mesmer and other hypnotists to control the audience and bring about a lot of psychosomatic healing. Interestingly enough, these people now we're teaching us how to control the alpha brainwave frequency at will. And we went through a course in which we learned techniques of guided imagery visualization, identical people to the ones I learned at John Wimber's church. We were there at the beginning when he first started with Ken Gullickson, the first vineyards. The exact same techniques that John Wimber's church was promoting of guided imagery visualization, promoted by Agnes Sanford, promoted, oh, by Richard Foster, because Agnes Sanford was a good mentor of Richard Foster's. You all know at Celebration of Discipline. Dallas Willard, whose materials are popular in virtually every seminar in this country, with few exceptions. Using those techniques, we were taught how to project our imagination so that we could read information about people anywhere in the world. The theory being that if you can pick up information about someone, you can send healing vibrations and rays to them. But the most important thing they did for us, besides teaching us how to be a, a conscious, wide awake Edgar Casey, he used to be known as the sleeping prophet, major misnomer, the guy wasn't asleep and he wasn't a prophet, he was a full trans medium who would go into an altered state and these voices would speak through him. A man, by the way, who was a genuine, sincere Christian, he thought. Read the Bible once a year for like, what, 43 years? Something along that line. Said, if ever the devil was going to pull a trick on me and deceive me, this would be it. But then he proceeded to give himself to the work because it felt so right. The fruit seemed so good. And using those same techniques, we were introduced to our wise persons, our counselors. Today, they call them spirit guides. They are being introduced to your school children in any number of school systems, thanks to Jack Canfield. You all are aware of the chicken soup for everything from, from nuts to, to pets. Chicken soup for the soul, chicken soup for the Christian soul, chicken soup for anybody and everybody. That same Jack Canfield, I've been tracking that turkey since like 1978, where he was busy putting out very openly then, and I document that in Like Lambs to the Slaughter, Your Child in the Occult, which is also on the back, promoting the techniques that they were using to introduce school children to their personal guides. And through them, I thought, well, what better guide can I have than Jesus? You see, I was an actual believer at the time. I believed in Jesus. I loved him with all my heart. Somebody had shared the four spiritual laws with me my freshman year in college. And I carried around my Bible. I prayed. I called out to this Jesus in terror, praying, desperately seeking for some relief from the forces that buffeted me at will. 
But now I was being told by Silva Method that I could have this Jesus. After all, didn't Jesus say, if you invite me in, if you knock at the door, oh, uh, and I will come in and sup with you. And I thought, I will invite Jesus. And so this Jesus came into this beautiful place, what, what Beth Moore and what Richard Foster and what Morton Kelsey and Henry Nouwen and the other contemplatives call moving into silence. And in this place of silence, created by going into an altered state of consciousness, I saw my Jesus coming down into this beautiful laboratory, this psychic laboratory, this place of silence that I created. And it was the most ecstatic, glorious experience I know, and my heart breaks and goes out to these men and women in the third wave movement, in the latter day reign and the manifest sons of God movement, the Todd Bentleys and the Bob Jones and the Paul Keynes and the Patricia Kings who talk about having these ecstatic experiences. Jesus came to me in my trailer before I move out, says the be tattooed poor tragic Todd Bentley whose life has been destroyed by the beings he trafficked with, thinking it was Jesus and Emma, Ms. Moneybag's angels, sprinkling gold dust up and down the aisles during these manifestations that have nothing to do with biblical manifestations or the presence of the Spirit of God. These are things that Carol and I and many others have been documenting or worse living through in the realm of the occult. And yet Christians like the world today are looking for experience that is the operative word. Spirituality in America, Newsweek, September 2005. The whole article there is talking about how from the Christians and the Roman Catholics and the Evangelicals and the Buddhists and the Sufis, the this, uh, esoteric branch of the, of the Muslims, and the Buddhists along with the Hindus and all, and the pagans, don't leave them out in the neo-pagans, the only group they left out were the Satanists, but I'm sure they're in there too, looking for an experience and people, they don't much care where they get it. Interestingly enough, I began to notice that my experience was being colored and my belief in Jesus and who he is was being colored by that experience. I became involved with yoga. I know some of you here have already been tackling Carol about how dare you say there is no such thing as Christian yoga. After all, Zondervan puts out books on it. The, the, the pastor's conference, I, we could take literally, I promise you I won't, Dr. Stan, but we could take a good four or five hours going through my documentation here, and this is just a tiny taste of what I usually haul around in my portable ammunition dump, of quotes from these people. How they talk about, hey, it's the intent that sanctifies the practice. Tilden Edwards, head of the Shalem Institute in Washington, one of the key contemplative training centers in the world, who says, hey, take any technique you want, be it from the Buddhists, or be it from the Muslims, or be it from the Sufis, or be it from the pagans, if your intent is to worship Jesus, you can do yoga, you can do anything you want, and God will be honored by it because you are Christianizing it. Oh, really? Somebody forgot to tell the living God. Deuteronomy 12. Make a note of it if you'd like. Because God, and we're going to talk about some of these other passages, the living God said in Deuteronomy chapter 12, Beware that you are not ensnared to follow after them. He was speaking to the children of Israel as they were moving into the promised land. And I'm going to read you from Deuteronomy 18 in a moment to tell you what else God has to think about the world of the occult. But here in Deuteronomy 12, he tells them, Beware you are not ensnared to follow after them after they are destroyed before you. You ever wonder why God wiped out the Hittites? and the Jebusites, and the Amorites, and all the other ites that were running, Canaanites that were running around in the land of Cana, the promised land. It's because they were involved in this kind of spiritual activity. The contemplative techniques, Christianized by the term contemplative, but with the same meditation which they used to contact their demon gods. Listen to what God says. Do not follow after them after they're destroyed before you, that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, How do these nations serve their gods, that I may also do likewise? 
You shall not behave thus toward the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 12, verse 30 and following. Look, God said, you cannot take the practices of the ancient pagan nations, throw Christian terminology at it, and think you're going to honor me with it, because your intent is to honor Jesus. Look, Ray Youngen wrote a book you all need to read. There's some wonderful ones. Ray Youngen, Roger Oakland, Warren Smith, Dave Hunt, Carol Matriciana. I've made a small and insignificant compared to theirs contribution on this field of spiritual deception. But all of them will say to you, as long as you're sincere, you can do whatever you want and honor God. Ray Youngen says in his book, A Time of Deception, look, the intent has nothing to do with it. You can have two people standing on a cliff. One has the intent to commit suicide and to smash on the bottom of the ravine. The other has the intent to fly. And the one throws himself off the cliff, full of positive imagery and Anthony Robbins' positive confessions and, and Norman Vincent Peale and Robert Schuller's positive speaking. I will fly, I will fly, I will fly, I will fly. Splat. <laughs> the other guy knew what his intent was. They both jumped off the cliff. They both wound up with the same result. Get the picture? Okay. So the intent has nothing to do with it. In fact, it is not a matter of focus, Dave Hunt said, but yoga was designed to create union with Hindu deities. You cannot use the breathing techniques of pranayama. I don't care that Rick Warren is promoting them. You cannot use those techniques and think you are going to encounter anything other than the ancient demon gods they were designed to put you in contact with. We could discuss that all day, but if you want to know, get Carol Matriciana's video on yoga and Dave Hunt's book on yoga uh, as well, key materials. I was involved in reincarnation out of body experiences. My psychic abilities were increasing and now that I was in silver mind control, I was having ecstatic experiences that convinced me this had to be from God. And through silver mind control, I was introduced. I was one of the star pupils there. At that time, he didn't have many pupils who had the facility for this kind of thing that I had. A dubious distinction at best, I assure you. And one night, this leader of the silver mind control in Mexico City said, Joe, I have got to take you to meet this woman. He had told us about her. An old woman in the slums of Mexico City who for some 40 odd years had been going into a trance state automatically and suddenly another being would take possession of her. A full trance channel. Any of you who watched Oprah Winfrey any number of years would have seen it take place on national television through Jay-Z Knight and any number of other sincere, deluded, deceived, demonized individuals as I was on my way to becoming. And this woman would sit in front of an altar and it had bizarre things on it, a rusty hunting knife and a pair of scissors and flowers and roses on there. It had a statue of Cuauhtémoc, the Aztec prince who claimed to be the one through whom Pachita was operating, the one who had been murdered by the conquistadores in Mexico City, untimely cut off, cut off because he wouldn't cough up Aztec treasure. And so now he was coming back to fulfill his karma, a term made very familiar to many of us by by Shirley MacLaine, you know, standing there on the shores of the Pacific. I am God, I am God. Now what she am is delusional. And if you want to know what these spirits coming through teaching you about karma and reincarnation have to say, they will teach you the same kinds of things that Esther Hicks teaches in The Secret. Rhonda Byrne's book that pretty much was written in conjunction with her, where the spirits come and say, if you send out negative vibrations, you're going to bring the negative karma back to yourself and the negative thing, as, as they say, what you are putting out is going to come back to you. The same kind of teaching, by the way, in Christianized garb, that you will see the positive confession teachers speaking. And here is this old woman sitting in front of this altar, and it has the statue of Cuauhtémoc, but it also has a crucifix on it and a picture of Jesus. And people, when I first went into this woman's home, filled, crowded with people. It was chaos, turmoil everywhere. People extremely well-dressed from the highest echelons of Mexican society, having come from all over Mexico to consult with her. People from across the border, from Canada, from, from the United States coming to see her. People from the lowest 
strata of society dressed in rags, but all of them with one thing in common, a desperate need for healing and for an experience that would tell them God, something cared for them and could bring restoration to them. And when I walked into this woman's room and I saw this old woman sitting there puffing on a cigarette with her hands covered up to her forearms in dried crusted blood, I said, my God, what takes place in this room? And I stood in front of the altar and I said, Lord Jesus, you know my heart. If you are working in this place, oh Jesus, I will give my life to this work and serve you here. Talk about sincerity and devotion. The woman identified me as a medium, something I'd never used as a term for myself. And I went back and for 14 months I became one of her personal assistants, the one in training, the chosen one who was designed and designated by the spirit to take over when she died. And I will tell you people, I watched over 400 operations. I had my hands in over 200 of them personally. I can't prove to you what happened happened. Dr. Stan, I know that as a medical man and the other doctors here, you listen to what I'm saying and they think, okay, I'm done, that's it. This woman is indeed certifiable. Where's the straitjacket? Where's the room next to the guy who thinks he's a poached egg? She's, f yeah. because what I saw was medically, physically impossible. In the power of this spirit, Pachita, now referred to as hermanito, little brother, no longer referred to as Pachita. The first operation I saw was on a woman who needed cataract surgery and back 33 years ago, 1971, 72, Cataract surgery wasn't what it is today. It was a lot more frightening, especially in Mexico. Sorry, Mexico, but that's the truth. And she begged Edmanito to do a surgery, and he did. He sits her down in a chair. Edmanito comes, I am with you, my little brothers, after we've recited the Lord's Prayer, after nuns and priests have been sprinkling holy water around. I am standing right behind this woman, as close to her face as I am to this microphone. I'm holding a piece of cotton underneath. It's the first surgery I've ever witnessed personally, and certainly the first one I've ever assisted in. And Hermanito is standing in front of her. She leans her head back. He takes a bottle of alcohol, brand new denatured alcohol that you use for disinfecting. And as he's telling her to lean back, I can see kind of a shimmer of a green light. It had no source there. The only source was a single light bulb that was turned off. There were only some candles on the altar but I could see clearly it was as though it was illuminated by this light. And Hermanito, through Pachita, takes the knife, begins to cut, takes the knife again and scrapes it, pours the bottle of denatured alcohol. And I don't know about you guys, but I've caught a little bit of alcohol as I've been sprinkling around disinfecting thermometers. I don't know about you guys, but my eyes hurt when I do that. Hermanito opened up the bottle, poured it in this woman's eye. She didn't blink. Oh no, Hermanito, I feel nothing. The patients were automatically anesthetized. And I watched as she peeled off this scum, put it on the cotton I was holding, peels off another one, bandages the woman up, has her carried out. About a week and a half, ten days later, the woman comes back. Oh, my cataracts are gone! I can see the doctors were awfully ticked off. They were planning on doing the surgery, but the cataracts aren't there. They can't figure it out. People I saw an operable brain tumor removed. A man from the American colony who'd been given up by, by his doctors for dead. And Hermanito stretches him out on a special plank, and I'm one of the assistants. I'm talking to this man, helping him stay conscious. And Hermanito, as he's lying there on a sheet on this plank, raises the knife in a salute and then the scissors, and plunges them into this man's skull. I know I've lost most of you here. I can only tell you what I saw. And he begins to part the skull, and he opens things up, and he's sticking his hand in there, and the man who was having the operation is saying, this is really freaky. I can feel the hand inside my head. Does it hurt? No, and all of a sudden as I'm talking to him, his eyes suddenly cross completely, completely, totally cross-eyed. They were not, normally. And he said, oi, this is really feeling weird as he's lying there with everything going triple. And I said, Edmanito, 
something's wrong. And Hermanito said, what is it? I said, his eyes are crossed. Well, that won't do, will it? And Hermanito puts his hand in, by the way, no sleeves, no pockets. I was often with Pachita setting up for these operations. We were not preparing little thumbs with fake betel nut juice in there or chicken gizzards that were palmed under somebody's whatever. He sticks his hand back in the man's skull after he's pulled out this mass that suddenly has, fills the room with a stench, this dark gangly thing. I don't know, I'm not a doctor. But it was long and it had gangly things and like nodules and it stank. And he puts his hand back in and as I'm watching the man, his eyes straighten back up again as evidently the optic nerve is straightened out. Oh, much better. People, I saw a young boy, born dumb, have a curse operation in which Edmanito slits his throat open while he's sitting there, his parents gasping. I had my mother and father there. And Edmanito reaches in and materializes. It's a well-known phenomena in the world of the occult. In India, they see it all the time. In Latin America, in the parts of the wild where the shamans and the witch doctors are, they see this with great frequency. He materialized a hair-covered rock from the boy's throat and removes it. And then he's standing there asking for a miniature key. And he's kind of tapping his foot and saying, it's in your purse. Hermanito nor Pachita had been in my mother's purse. They didn't know what was on her keychain. My mother had a beautiful little tiny miniature key. He takes the key, he puts it in the boy's throat, he turns the thing, he bandages him up, and then he commands this boy, who has never spoken a word or said a sound. He couldn't even grunt, except occasionally. And he passes his hand over and he commands the boy to speak. And the first word this boy speaks is my father's name. And the parents are falling down before Hermanito, Pachita. Oh, God bless you, Hermanito. And Hermanito very humbly says, oh, no, little ones. All glory to my father above. You don't think that's impressive? You don't think that when I spoke to Edith Schaefer, the wife of one of the great theologians of the 20th century, who has since gone home to be with the Lord, and she happened to be in the same place where, where I was in Acapulco one day, and we got into a conversation. Someone who was close to me at that time was attending Libri and was very close to them, and they wanted them to talk to me and straighten me out. If anybody could, Edith Schaefer could. And she's talking to me, and I'm sitting back. And I have to tell you, I blush in mortification at what I said to Frances Schaeffer, one of the greatest Christian ladies. I said to her, Mrs. Schaeffer, with all due respect, although I felt none, you wouldn't know a genuine miracle if it rang you down in the street. You narrow-minded, Bible-thumping, fundamentalist, evangelical dogmatist. How dare you tell me this isn't from God? After all, by their fruits you shall know them, right? Doesn't the Bible say, Matthew 7, you will know them by their fruits? And the little lesson in basic spiritual agriculture, good fruit doesn't come from bad trees, bad trees don't produce good fruit, you'll know them by their fruits. Children are being healed. A, a, a Korean War veteran who was paraplegic is now beginning to get sensation and movement in his legs. Brain tumors inoperable are being removed. Children are being given back to their parents, restored in whole lung transplants, vertebra transplants. I know I just lost the rest of you. How can you tell me this is not from God, you narrow-minded Bible thumper? And isn't that the attitude of most Christians? How can you, perhaps someone even in this room said it not too many hours ago, how dare you say to me that my Christian yoga isn't from God? It is my intent to honor Jesus. It's good fruit. I feel the warm fuzzies. I feel close to God. I'm praying. Don't you know how to pray? You ever notice the arrogance of those who defend their positions in occultism? The problem is most of us in the occult never bother reading the rest of the story. We wouldn't know how to test the spirits of God to see whether they're from God in accordance with the word of God. But if it ran us down, because now we have gotten away from the word. So we do not know the word of God in Deuteronomy 18, where it says, when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, 
Deuteronomy 18 verses 9 and following, you shall not learn to imitate the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes a son or his daughter pass through the fire. You see, God is about to give you the full spectrum of occultism. From the sincere fuzzy-wuzzy superstitions, but starting with child sacrifice. It doesn't matter what aspect of occultism you think you're sanctifying for God, or that I thought, or Pachita thought, she was sanctifying to God. And let me tell you how I know what the work being done there was in essence and where it was not originating. It was not originating from God. How do I know? By looking at the Word of God. Deuteronomy 18, Moses was recapitulating, recapitulating, not the right term, uh, reiterating the laws and the rules and the regulations that God, being God, here's a thought, one of the personal perks of personal divinity is you get to make the rules. It's not the Ten Suggestions, it's the Ten Commandments. The Lord Jesus himself said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I tell you? And here the Lord, the living God says, you are not to follow these abominable practices. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, an abysmal and despicable form of human sacrifice practiced by the Canaanites and the Jebusites and the Amorites and the Carthaginians and a whole bunch of other people in that neck of the woods, even to their shame by the Israelites themselves in honor of God. And God now is saying, do not practice child sacrifice for those who assume that because certain self-appointed critics of, of all things Christian have assured us that there is no problem with Satanism and tell us there is no such thing as human sacrifice. Think again, it's happening all the time and some of it will even take place during this season. I suggest to you there's another form of human sacrifice that maybe we haven't even considered. Oh, maybe not to the god Molach or Chemosh or Tanit or any of the other Baals. How about to the god of the humanists? The God's self. I am, there is no other. No one will sit in judgment of me. This isn't a child, a human being. One of our candidates for political office, the highest in the land, feels the decision about when life begins is way beyond his great pain. I couldn't agree more. And feels then that he has no right to decree when life starts. And so it's not a life, it's not a human being, it's a blob of tissue and we wipe it from our lives because it's inconvenient. The God of the humanists, the God self, is every bit as despicable to the Lord as Chemosh or Molach. But listen to what else God puts in here with divination coming next. Along with human sacrifice there shall not be anyone who uses divination, the mantic arts. The Ouija board is a form of divination. It is not a game. I don't care that Parker Brothers markets it next to Monopoly. It is one of the most ancient and deadly forms of contacting the spirit realm. In 1951, when the latest of the, the witchcraft acts was repealed in Britain, the Wiccans, the witches, petitioned Parliament to please ban the Ouija board because kids were using it and falling into disastrous recommendations by the spirits who were coming through one of the most deadly forms of communing with spirits. But there's another form of divination. It's not just the Ouija board or the crystal ball or the tarot cards or palm reading or the I Ching for which Carl Jung wrote his, his great forward and, and translations. It's also an interior form of divination. You remember Acts chapter 16, the girl with the spirit of divination? This girl had a spirit and she kept following after Paul and Silas, Acts 16 as they were going interestingly to the place of prayer and she cried after them these men are servants of the Most High God was that true? yeah who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation literally if you look in the original here she was saying who are proclaiming to you a way of salvation Jesus Christ one of many equally good ways the Jesus now of Brian McLaren named one of the 25 most influential evangelicals who speaks at the pastor's conferences, who is touted and revered on, on TBN, I was just told. He's being praised as, oh, a man of great insight and wisdom, who says the cross is despicable and dreadful advertising for Jesus Christ. 
Purple Pod broadcast with Leif Hansen a couple, uh, two years ago. I'll give you the exact material. I've got it here. I won't take the time to look at it. And who tells you that really Jesus and this whole concept of, of uh, the, the singular, unique Jesus is pretty much a terrible thing to be done with. Shouldn't we be thinking about it more as Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King? A spirit of divination, a seducing spirit. And Paul, you would have thought, might have been tempted to say, well, hey, we're getting the endorsements of the opposition, let's embrace it. After all, doesn't the intent sanctify the practice? She seems sincere, she's speaking scriptural truth, wasn't she, up to a point? Just one teeny little change of a letter from the way to a way, but gads, are we going to be that picky and dogmatic? What did Paul say? He turned and he said, not to her latent power, not to her divine higher self within, not to the Christ consciousness, not to her normal ability, the gift that we are all born with, as, as Frank Pastore, God bless him, said, oh, this is a gift of the spirit, and depending on your intent, whether you're into spiritism or worshiping God, that's what decrees whether it's going to be a true word of knowledge from the living God or something from the occult. Huh? doctrines of demons. Paul turned and he said to the demon, to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. So much for the intent sanctifies the practice. What would he have said to those promoting the contemplative prayer movement, the Agnes Sanfords and the, the, the Richard Fosters and the Dallas Willards and the Henry Nowens and the Thomas Mertens of today or the Suman kids Interesting to see what would be hopping off those poor people. But listen to what else? Divination, forbidden. Or one who practices witchcraft. Sorry, Harry Potter and Hermione. And he doesn't distinguish between the white witches who are good and doing good things or the black witches who are deliberately doing evil and drawing the pentacles on the ground and lighting their black candles to summon demons. Which they do, by the way, on a regular basis, but especially during these high holy days. Those who take the scripture seriously need to be aware of what's out there and what they're doing. Or the purple, yellow, pur spotted polka dot ones. Sorry, Hermione, witchcraft is condemned by scripture. Or one who interprets omens. Those of you who've been thinking, ah, home free, none of this affects me. How many of you wore your lucky cross to make sure the demons didn't get you on the way home from this lecture? Some of you were awfully quiet. How many of you wear your lucky socks when you play your tennis match, even though you've been wearing them and they've got holes in them and they're about to fall off because they're putrefied and could walk? How many of you know that little horses in some parts of the country are walking around in their stocking feet and have been for decades because the farmers insist on taking their shoes and nailing them to the wall to keep in the good luck? A symbol of the goddess, Diana. Hundreds of thousands of forms of superstitions, the most intelligent of people, have them. God says it's the earliest form of magic and abomination right up in there with human sacrifice. Or a sorcerer, the use of hallucinogenic drugs to put you more rapidly into an altered state of consciousness through which you can contact the inner divine within, the Christ consciousness, or the mediums contacting the spirit guides and the other beings in the astral planes. Sorcery, sorry Harry Potter. God con condemns as abomination, and by the way, the term abomination carried with it the penalty of death. In the days of the theocracy, which mercifully I'm happy we're not living in today, there's probably more of us here than would like to admit it in public who would already have attended the first rock concerts and we wouldn't have enjoyed them. Or one who casts a spell, sorry again, Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, you want to know about Harry Potter, look at uh, Carol Matriciana's video. Or a medium. Ooh, this one got me where it hurts. I was a medium. A go-between this realm and the realm of the dear departed. The ghost whisperer. Medium. Right? The, the TV programs. All of these people who think they're contacting the realm, what they're contacting. You ever watch Ghostbuster? Who are you going to call? Ghostbuster. You remember that scene in Ghostbuster where the Ghostbusters are walking in the library and they look and there's this beautiful grandmotherly type spirit hovering over one of the books. Shh, says the little lady as they come in but they aren't buying it. And as they come closer, ready with their ghost zapper, did you remember, remember what happened? 
Suddenly it turns and this demon shoo, comes at them. That's what you're dealing with. Satan knows how to disguise himself as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11. Or a spiritist. Or one who calls up the dead. Sorry, Benny Hinn who says and openly talks about how he sits on the grave of Catherine Coleman and Amy Semple McPherson to commune with their spirits and absorb the anointing, praise God. He's absorbing an anointing all right, but it is not from the living God. These people are engaged in things that God has called abomination and the Lord is not amused for whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord. And because of these detestable things, the Lord your God will drive them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God for those nations which you shall dispossess. Listen to those who practice witchcraft and to diviners. But as for you, people of God, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do so. When they say to you, consult the mediums and the wizards who chirp and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living, Isaiah 8, to the law and the testimony? If they do not speak according to this word, taken in context, read and studied and understood for what it is, the word of the living, awesome, fearsome God, who when he says, thou shalt not, is not joking. And don't think Christians can't be deceived. We started talking about the fruit, and I'll end with this, Pastor. I know that we're just about at the end of our time. In Matthew chapter 7, you will know them by their fruit. You know, it starts out with enter by that narrow-minded, Bible-thumping, fundamentalist, dogmatic gate. For the gate is open and broad-minded that leads to what? Destruction. And many are those who enter by it. If you're being accused of, of being narrow-minded, thank them. They're right. All their paths do lead to God. And if Jesus is right, you don't want to go there. The way is narrow that leads to salvation, and few are those who find it. You will know them by their fruits. Now let's look at the rest of that. In here he is saying now, in verse 15 of Matthew chapter 7, Beware of the false prophets. The landscape today, thanks to the third wave, and the manifest sons of God, and the, the spiritual descendants of the latter reign and the third the third now wave of the Spirit of God, all the self-appointed prophets and apostles who are coming to you saying, Thus saith the Lord, because the word of God isn't quite sufficient enough, and they're coming speaking to you, looking and sounding in many aspects like a genuine prophet, like a genuine teacher, like a true believer. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Beware, do you, uh, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, Sounding, looking, talking, perhaps like the genuine article, the true believer, but inwardly, spiritually, by what they're teaching you are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. We've looked at that. But then now look at the rest of the passage because it was part of the verse that I never, and most occultists, and I'm willing to venture, very few in the evangelical, charismatic, or Pentecostal church today have looked at. Many will say to me, what? All right, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, which tells you one thing, let's stop right here. What is the will of the Father? Oh, that we do good works, and that we do social justice, and that we, we cast out demons, and that we do all the things Jesus did, and that we are, yes, those things are good, but he obviously means something else here. In John chapter 6 and 1 John 31, uh, 3, verse 23, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? They asked Jesus. This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom we have sent. Oh, but we do believe in Jesus. Really? Goody for you. Which one? 2 Corinthians 11. I guess if, if the name and claim it, positive confession people are right, the mess the church is in has to be the Apostle Paul's fault. Because in 2 Corinthians 11, he said, I'm afraid for you, little children, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches, thank you, another Jesus, whom we have not... Ooh, what? There's another Jesus? 
or a different gospel which we have not given. What? There's another gospel? Or a different spirit which you have not received? You fool spirit, beautifully. If we or an angel from heaven, Galatians 1, should come to you and preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached, let him be anathema. Let him be cursed to hell. How's that for politically correct? How many pastors are willing to stand up today and say that to a congregation? Or to the Benny Hins, or to the William Branhams, or to the Cheons, or to the Todd Bentleys, or any of these other sincere, deluded Christians who are out deceiving and being deceived, who did not pay attention to the words of the Apostle Paul in Acts 20, when he said, Do not forget for three years I warned you with tears that from among your own selves men would arise, speaking perverse things, leading the flock after them. Test the spirits to see whether they're from God people. Because spiritual deception is the first and the chief of the signs that Jesus himself gave us. And many who are coming to him saying, but Lord, Lord, in your name we prophesied. In your name we did many miracles. In your name we cast out demons. In other words, using the name of Jesus, we did genuine phenomena. Look, when I finally realized I was following the wrong Jesus in my spiritual laboratory, and through some, I don't have time to get into it now, or Dr. Stan's going to yank my lecture now from under me. When I realized I was following another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel, and recognized how easily I'd been deceived, I said, Lord God, there is another Jesus, and we better learn how to test it. Have we not done this genuine phenomena? I went back to Mexico knowing I could never go back to working with Pachita, but I was still more psychic than ever before. Now preaching Jesus, and mind you, with part of, of Labrie and Oz Guinness, who led me to the Lord along with Sheila Bird as part of my pedigree. How dare you touch God's anointed, I could have said. I know now exactly what you're thinking and what you're doing and what's coming in the future. Thus saith the Lord. How many of the self-appointed prophets and prophetesses of today have occult backgrounds that have never been renounced or dealt with, who think they are serving Jesus, but they have another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel? I never knew you, the Lord will declare to them. It is not enough to be sincere. It is not enough to throw the name Jesus. You need to know which Jesus, which spirit, which gospel. Today, more than ever, we need the gift of discernment. And i got to tell you, the church today has all the discernment of your average pogo stick. They really do. Oh, it feels right. Don't touch God's anointed. And don't you dare test this. How dare you say Todd Bentley is not from God. I've got letters here from God. Boy, it's amazing how crap he is. Excuse me. His King James English got recently. I, the Lord, saith to thee, Johanna, if thou comest against my servant, Toddeth Bentleyeth, thou wilt suffereth the pains of hell, and the, because thou art coming against me, thus saith the Lord. How do I know that's not from God? Because the word of God commands me to test the spirits to see whether they're from God, First John 4, and about 18 dozen other passages we could look at. Yes. Beloved, do not be deceived. We are in the end times. Judgment has already come upon this land. Why did he bring judgment upon his children? Why did he bring judgment upon the Canaanites against Babylon, against Egypt, against the Assyrians? Because they practiced these things, Isaiah chapter 2, my people are filled with influences from the east. They adopt all the prophets who steal their words from one another and say, thus saith the Lord, and my people all love it so. If you think that God will leave this nation unjudged, it has begun. It began several decades ago in the house of God where judgment has begun. You think that the living God will not judge us when he brought judgment upon his own people and the other ancient nations for the same practices we are embracing to our bosom and defending as of God because the prophet said so. 
think again. Sovereign living God, open our eyes and open our ears. Today, if you hear the word of the Lord, do not harden your hearts. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen.